Good morning. Thanks. I want to say, first of all, that I'm really honored to be uh, giving a talk here at CSDMS. Um, and I'm going to be talking about some land lab modeling eventually. Uh, full disclosure, this model was running first at 4.45 on Friday. Um, so, so there's some sort of preliminary results here, but we are conserving water, which is a good thing. Um, I think maybe, perhaps especially for this context of bridging boundaries, the more um, useful, hopefully useful thing that I'm going to talk about is really uh, about the, the gains that this group I'm working with had to make in terms of our conceptual models uh, in order to do this work. And so, um, as a person with a very traditional geology and geomorphology background, I was carrying around some conceptual models that were uh, just just too simple, not quite not quite sufficient for doing this. And so I'm going to spend some time on these aha moments that we had as a group, um, which if you're coming from hydrology, uh, might not really be aha moments to you. They might be pretty pretty obvious to you. Um, okay, so I'm going to tell a story. Uh, about this group of collaborators and, and I who've been working on how landscapes evolve following continental glaciation in the central lowlands, which is just a fancy term for the Midwest. Um, okay, so acknowledging my co-authors, Jingtao Lai, who's here, he's gonna actually talk about some of this work tomorrow, uh, and Cecilia Cullen, who's um, the student behind the model that I'm gonna show you at the end of this talk. I've also got collaborators, Peter Moore, Bradley Miller, and Josh McDaniel at uh, Iowa State, and then Karen Grant and Brian Sockness at University of Minnesota Duluth. Okay, so our story of post-glacial landscapes starts before the glaciation of this region, and I just want to remind you that before glaciation, there were actually well-developed drainage networks um, in this area, and they had things like big incised bedrock valleys. Okay, so We've got, this is an example, this is the uh, Tays Muhammad um, system, so kind of a Ohio River scale sort of thing with bedrock valleys in size 50 meters or so. Um, and if you know the, the river networks of the Midwest, this doesn't really correspond with the modern river valley. Okay, and that's because these valleys got filled up with sediment um, during the, a set of glaciations. Now, what's hard to see on this slide maybe is this is the valley I'm talking about, okay? So this bedrock valley, the Taste Muhammad Valley is like 10 kilometers wide uh, here in Champaign County, and it's filled up with a stack of pre-Illinois episodes, so greater than half a million year old glacial outwash, and then till from the penultimate glaciation and the most recent glaciation, we see inside that big valley, a stack of penultimate glaciation outwash, Wisconsin episode outwash, and then here is the modern Sangamon River, River Valley uh, inset into that set, that stack. Okay, now it's a, it's a different question for a different time, why we have sort of superimposed all these valleys at, at different scales. Um, but what I wanna point out is we had, a, we had a big, big drainage network, it's all filled up, and now we have no topographic expression of that. Okay. Now this slide is really courtesy of uh, Andy Wickard, who helped me see this clearly um, for the first time. Um, but essentially, the drainage network for the whole Mississippi was really, really different uh, when the ice was here. Okay. So we can look at this reconstruction of the ice sheet. Here's the centers of, of accumulation and the uh, drainage glacial um, divide there, okay? So all of this stuff is going this way, okay? Here's the modern uh, Mississippi basin on there. So we've got hundreds of kilometers more uh, to the north of us. All that water is coming out through these river networks, okay? So this, this makes it sort of not surprising that we're gonna be doing lots of sediment transport, um, down these, down this, at the, out this southern margin, and we're actually going to be having erosive conditions sometimes too. Uh, so this is a really, really famous example of this enormous proglacial lake, glacial Lake Agassiz, during the retreat of the Laurentide Ice Sheet, which uh, several times catastrophically drains down 
um, the Minnesota River and carves this big, big valley all the way down to bedrock. Okay? But this pattern of incising river valleys at, toward the end of the glaciation happens in a lot of places. Okay, so the Ohio River is like this too. The Illinois River, the Wisconsin River, the Wabash River, the Sangamon River. Okay, they're all these really, really big valleys in size toward the end of the most recent glaciation. And now there are the major rivers of the Midwest living down in the bottom of those valleys with these floodplains meandering around between these valley walls. Okay, so all of this leaves us with the landscape that we have in this region, which has some positive release features like end moraines, wildly vertically exaggerated here. Uh, the University of Illinois sits on an end moraine, big end moraine. Uh, it's about six kilometers wide and 20 meters tall. Okay, that's the big positive relief feature. And then we have these negative relief features, which are these incised valleys. Okay, they can be incised. Uh, the Sangamon's incised about 15 meters, okay, the Wabash maybe 70, um, so sort of tens of meters incised, big negative relief features. And then we have this, uh, which we refer to as the uplands. Um, I'm not sure that that means the same thing in other parts of the world. Um, we, we talk about that as the upland. Okay, so this flat surface, and a key feature of this surface is that it's got a lot of closed depressions in it. Okay. So while the, the water associated with this melting of the Laurentide ice sheet carves these big, huge valleys, it doesn't really effectively drain most of the landscape. Okay. We're left with a whole bunch of area that's, that's stranded. That's not part of these external drainage networks. Okay. So we have lots and lots of closed depressions, lakes and potholes and so on. But just uh, in central Illinois, it's just wet prairie. Okay, they're not even particularly um, clear topographic expressions. It's just the water table is high and there's nowhere, there's nowhere for water to go. Okay, so what we know about these landscapes is that this condition of having all this non-contributing area doesn't last forever. Okay, we can take advantage of the fact and we have surfaces that were glaciated at really different times most recently across the Midwest and do the classic geology space for time swap and think about how must development proceed, okay? So again, this black area is all glaciated more than half a million years ago most recently. The dark gray here in Southern Illinois, about 130,000 years ago most, most recently glaciated and then all the light gray areas during the most recent glaciation, although there's considerable vari variability in the timing between the different lobes, and then you have the retreat of those lobes, giving us surfaces of different ages. So going way back to Rui in 1956, he's making an observation that as you go off of the Des Moines lobe, off of this recently glaciated surface onto the much older surface, there's a pretty marked increase in drainage density, okay? So channels are growing in to drain those uplands. Um, so one of the big efforts of this uh, collaboration has been to uh, try to look at this from a, a different angle. It's really difficult to reconstruct drainage density in the Midwest because there's a lot of drainage ditches. Okay, so we see like a 300% increase in uh, channel length uh, in our county. Um, that's that's not natural. So instead of looking at drainage, we've been looking using soils data to try to identify areas that were closed depressions or were at least very poorly drained um, prior to agriculture. Okay, so we can look at those um, and we can use um, more detailed chronologies of the ages of these surfaces and make plots like this, which are showing us the percentage of non-contributing area. So this is how much of the land surface is this poorly drained um, disconnected stuff versus the age of those surfaces, and you could see decreases over time. Okay, so we're losing non-contributing area over time. Um, uh, several students are working on expanding this um, to much bigger regions, okay, and trying to constrain um, 
here. So here we're looking at, in general, as we get to darker red, we're getting to older surfaces. And in general, as we get to lighter orange, we're getting to less and less non-contributing area. So it's a pretty good relationship. We're working on now splitting this out according to landform type. So can we find glacial lake plains on all these different surfaces? Or can we find look at moraines on all these different surfaces and so on? Uh, so this is a bit preliminary, but I think we're gonna, we're gonna see that these patterns hold. Okay, so we're gaining drainage density, we're losing non-contributing area, but how? Um, this is what these landscapes look like, and there's not a whole lot to work with here. Okay, <laughs> we, don't, we don't have a lot of slope, and we, it's, it's really hard to see how you organize the water. Um, to get it together. Uh, this picture, for example, this is actually the high relief part of the upland. This is the, these are the heady heights of the Champagne Moraine here, okay? So that's, that's the big action place um, that we have. All right, so yeah, so the slopes we have are actually on the edges of these incised valleys. We have these valley walls, we have those slopes. So we think Let's treat this like essentially like the same problem as passive margin great escarpment retreat, right? We've got to we've got to grow channels into this flat plateau um, away from this escarpment slope along these valley walls, um, and to do that we got to give them water. So, so we went back to Tom Dunn. How do you get water into channels, right? How do you get runoff generated? Uh, so this is his classic figure um, telling us about how not all the water in the channel came from flowing over the surface, right? A lot of it probably came from this uh, shallow subsurface flow or maybe from groundwater flow, okay? So let's think about how we get water in the channel and that's, let's think about what, you know, what would Tom Dum have seen if he was working in a landscape like this, uh, where it's really flat, it becomes, really unclear that those surface water divides, which you can still define, right? You can still define surface water divides, but it becomes really unclear that those are very important in driving the water flow, okay? So essentially this question boils down to, are, are drainage divides, are watersheds really good indicators of how much discharge we should expect? Okay, so here's, like the first paradigm that I had a lot, a lot of trouble with breaking, okay? Because what is this, I mean, my kids are being taught this in elementary school right now. Okay, you live in a watershed and that's, it's all going down there, right? And that's true in Boulder, um, but not, not so clearly true all the time in Illinois. Um, so you start feeling like you're on thin ice when you say maybe, maybe watersheds aren't real. Um, okay. <laughs> So in particular, like we have these closed depressions and they all have watershed boundaries. They have contributing areas. They're not very well drawn right here. Oh, as an aside, this is actually a geopark in Denmark that is dedicated to the glories of the post-glacial, post-continental glaciation landscape. And it is amazing. And if anybody wants to help me do this, I would love to have a, a Midwest geopark. I think that would be excellent. Um, but yeah, they have these same sort of closed depressions. So what happens to that water? Does it do any geomorphic work? Okay, is this, is this of any importance to us? Well, one thing we know it does is we know that water within those depressions uh, contributes to slope wash that sort of fills them slowly over time. We see this most clearly when we look at what's happening after agriculture. Okay, so here's an example. Um, this is near uh, Purdue. There's a basin here. You can see this is kind of hundreds of meters in scale. There's a basin of a closed depression. And what they've done is map out, this is what the soil surface is like now. And there's a paleosol they can define. That's the pre-agricultural surface. Okay, so the swale's getting filled up with stuff. If we, if we think about the time before agriculture, we still see like thickened A horizons and so on in the whole, in the bottoms of these depressions. So probably even without agriculture, we're filling in these depressions slowly over time, it's essentially making it flatter, but that's, it's, it's, it's helping us with our problem of getting water out of the landscape. 
Um, but let's think about other ways that we could get water out of the landscape, not just by filling up these depressions uh, with sediment, but maybe we could just fill them up with water. Okay, we know that happens, that sometimes the closed depressions get filled up to their spill points and they spill over and the water goes other places. Okay, here's a, an example of a really, these are really big closed depressions, uh, really deep ones from the prairie potholes region. And here's their conceptual model of how as the water level rises in the different depressions, they spill over into one another and, and maybe eventually into some external networks. And so here's an example of mapping all the flow paths between all these different closed depressions. All right, uh, so Jing Tao will talk tomorrow about what happens if you make a numerical model of how that changes landscape evolution. What if that water from those closed depressions actually did contribute uh, to headward growth of, of tributaries? And I don't wanna wreck everything for him. I wanna not steal his thunder too much, but I think uh, it's safe to say that that you will see that the rate of evolution and the channel morphology itself is really different if we make the water come out of those closed depressions versus keeping it, keeping it in there. Okay, so more on that tomorrow. Um, but my other student, Cecilia, was working on what happens if we are moving groundwater um, to feed growing tributaries. And I wanted to show you this picture. Again, if you're a hydrologist, maybe this is really uh, boring to you, but to me this was like, ah, I can't believe it. Groundwater divides don't have to be the same as surface water divides, okay? And in this case I'm showing you, they're actually really, really different, okay? So this is in central Illinois. Here's the Mackinac River. You can see the rivers are going north, east to southwest, right? And here's the groundwater divide, which is basically orthogonal to that, okay? So the groundwater is not doing what the surface water divides tell it to do. This is an extreme example. This is a, it's a pretty shallow sand and gravel aquifer, um, but you know, this is a kind of a, an extreme example. What I'm thinking about more is, is simply that those really subtle surface topographic divides are not the major force for this, okay? Groundwater between these big and sized river valleys is going to move toward those big and sized valleys, even if it has to go over a half a meter. I mean, even if there's a half a meter of relief between there. Okay. Uh, so we we know that when we look around toward the headward end of some of these streams, and this is this one's Minnesota, this is Iowa. I think that's Minnesota as well. We see springs of groundwater coming out toward these channel heads. Uh, here it's running on the top of, of bedrock, uh, but in these two, it's uh, this one. I think it's running on kind of a lag of sand and gravel um, on top of a till sheet, and here it's coming out at the interface between luss and till. Uh, so there's a lot of variability in the permeability uh, within these systems, and there's places where the groundwater kind of tends to come out. So Cecilia um, developed this sort of block diagram of a kind of a conceptual model of what we think is happening. So we're imagining now this, this steep slope, there's gonna be a huge river. You know, this is like the Ohio River coming in and out of the page. And here's a little tributary trying to grow up into the upland. And now let's say we have groundwater coming from over here, flowing through the system, even though we might have surface water divides within there, okay? Um, so, you know, again, here's our, this is our growing stream. Here's the cliff, the elevation, that 15 meter valley wall uh, at the edge of the river. And then we're imagining groundwater is flowing toward there. Okay. So we started with the simplest thing we could, we could do. Okay, so we're not thinking about the, the Vado zone. Okay, we're not thinking about details of what is this aquifer like. We're just saying, there's water, it's, it's moving, we're just gonna use Darcy flow to say it, it depends on some conductivity and it depends on the head gradient, okay? So we're gonna, we're gonna make this model, we're gonna say I'm gonna fix a flux in through this boundary. Here's my river valley on this side, I'm gonna fix the head there um, at, at zero, it's coming out to the surface along this boundary all the time, and I'm gonna just say uh, there's no flow across the top and bottom boundaries. 
Okay, so we got this, and now we're going to try to put this in LandLab. So what do we do? LandLab has lots, it's really set up to do this in a great way. Okay, so LandLab already could handle spatially variable runoff rates. You can just pass, pass this field that's runoff rate. Okay, so we, we start by saying, well, let's, let's have this unit runoff rate that's just equal to precipitation. Okay, now we got to find where we think the groundwater is coming out into topography. For now, we just made up a rule and said anytime we erode down to 10 meters of elevation, we're going to put that water out on the surface. Okay, so then we're going to fix the head at that point. It's essentially like making a new um, fixed, fixed condition inside our model domain. Um, then we've got to iterate our, our groundwater model till it gets to a new steady state. Okay, and then we're going to calculate how much water would be coming out of all those seeps at that steady state. We're going to add that seep flux to the runoff rate field, and then you just pass that over to existing modules in land lab that are going to route it by steepest descent. In particular here, we're not using any fill and spill closed depression routing, so we're just doing it. It's only going to route the stuff out um, that's, that's properly downhill, uh, and then we're going to erode the topography as a function of the discharge of the slope. Uh, so just to show an example of a simulation, so here this 10 meter threshold would be the boundary between the kind of the orange and the brown, uh, and here's the head, the steady state head that makes sense with that, and you can see there's a little bit of, of curving of those head gradients um, that happens, okay? So there's a little bit of focusing of water to those channel heads. It's actually a little bit less than I would have expected, uh, but like I said, I'm showing you the first six model runs that we made. Uh, so so th this is probably a function of how conductive things are and so on. Um, okay, so let's look at what happens. We'll start with a case where we don't have any groundwater. We're just going to put precipitation on here, equivalent to having a meter a year of, of rainfall. And this is not exactly the initial condition, but is, is early in the simulation because the initial condition is so hard to interpret, basically. Uh, so here's our big valley, here's our upland. After 20,000 years, we get this. Um, so channels are growing into the upland, right? Uh, here's what, I'm gonna show you several graphs like this. So this blue dashed line is how much precipitation we're putting into the domain, okay? And the, the solid line is how much of that water is making it out the left edge of the model, okay? So I showed you a time in, in here, if we evolve it a little more eventually, we're getting all the precipitation out, okay? So it's all drained. Um, we're not putting in any groundwater, but I'm gonna show you green curves for groundwater in a second. So we get a channel network, we've got a river discharge in there, and this is, this is just reminding us what that topography looks like. Okay, so now I'm gonna take 20% of that precipitation and say it's coming as groundwater instead. So same total amount of water, some of it's groundwater, some of it's um, surface, some of it's precipitation, okay? And so what happens is my total discharge here in black is a combination of precipitation going out and the groundwater coming out. And you can see that that still grows over time, okay? And we get a slightly different drainage network coming. We're starting with the same initial random seed on top here. Um, but now discharge and drainage area aren't the same thing anymore in this model, right? That extra groundwater um, is focusing more into this stream than into other ones, okay? So we're having so a little bit of competition between these stream networks. Okay, if I make 80% of the ground, water come out of the ground and only a little bit over the surface, now we're starting to see that this, this topography after 20,000 years is, is kind of different. At this resolution, it's really hard to even think of this as topography. Um, but what you're seeing here is that the, there's really not, no area at these kind of intermediate slow, uh, elevations. It's a really, really steep scarp, um, and we have more channels forming on the edge here. And the evolution is actually a little bit slower um, when we make it all um, groundwater, or almost all groundwater. And you can see that we're nowhere near kind of achieving getting all the water out of the domain yet. Okay, so again, uh, drainage area and discharge are really different in this model, um, but you can see some differences in the structure here. We've got more, more like six or seven big streams 
uh, in this case instead of three or four. Okay, so we can look through a whole suite of these things as we go from no groundwater to 80% groundwater. If I showed you 100% groundwater, what happens the way our model is set up is all the water goes out that cliff edge, that escarpment face, and nowhere is it sufficient to actually start incising a channel on its own. So you just have a line of seeps um, and nothing happens. So I didn't, I didn't show you the picture. Uh, but we can see changes in the steepness of the escarpment, changes in the sinuosity of the escarpment, changes in the number of streams that grow. Uh, so as we increase the fraction of the contribution from groundwater, we get more steep parallel uh, retreat of the scarp. Uh, we get a slightly slower capture of drainage area. Um, there's more branching of the stream network with more groundwater. Uh, and the, the escarpment front, I think, becomes a little bit more sinuous at first and then less sinuous after that. So I'm quite interested in this sort of sweet spot of part groundwater and part surface water, maybe driving some more variability in the stream network. Um, but early days here, uh, of course, we, we see big changes in the stream profiles too. So I'm showing here the profile of the longest stream evolving over time in these simulations. And essentially, they, they're not uniformly concave, right? Uh, they get really kinked. And especially as we put more and more groundwater in, we get a real contrast between how steep they are up high above the groundwater coming in and how steep they are below where the groundwater comes in. OK, so we've got a lot to do. <laughs> we, we, we need to explore the sensitivity of the model to things like where we put the groundwater in, what are the rules for, for where it emerges onto the surface. Uh, we're working on incorporating spatial heterogeneity um, into the conductivity of the subsurface. So, so that would just be sort of in the map view, okay, not in the, not in the vertical. Uh, we would like to consider the importance of filling of depressions over time. We do use some diffusion in the model, but the, at the resolution we're at, with the slopes we have, it doesn't change the, the depressions very much. Okay, so we, we're looking into that. Um, we would also like to include episodic fill and spill of surface water. Okay? So again, in Land Lab, that would be, it would be easy to implement that. We could just, at certain time steps, say, OK, go ahead and route all the water out. Um, that would be one way to approach that. We could also think about more, more subtle ways to do it. Say, let's fill the shallow depressions till they spill. Uh, and leave the deep ones disconnected. Uh, and finally, we're working as a group to document the rates and mechanisms of uh, channel network expansion in the field. Um, so if you have any ideas about how to do that, I'd be interested. Uh, we're looking at some, some places in Iowa where we, can ha we have Holocene uh, alluvium of different ages that we can find at different points along valleys. So to look for sort of headward expansion uh, over time of those, and we've also found some kind of interesting examples. I'm going to just leave you with this one. Um, this is from the Minnesota DNR uh, Conservation Magazine, um, and it's a story about the mysterious disappearance of Miller Lake. Uh, so this is a this is a lake. This is actually a relatively high relief area. This is a lake um, that essentially filled up to its spill point um, during a time when the ground was frozen. Okay. And then there was a beaver dam holding it, holding the, the channel between the, the spill point and the next point down. And essentially there was a catastrophic erosion event of that, of that spillway, which is again, a process we don't, we don't have in our model, but looks like it happens at least sometimes. This is one way that we can kind of get this strange network connected up. Um, and this lake drained, um, which was remarkable to, uh, to people who just, went expecting to see a lake and it wasn't there anymore. Okay, well, so with that, I will take any questions you have. Mm -hmm. In the back. I, I see lots of questions. We're gonna stick to one or two. Okay. And then uh, people can uh, talk to Alison in the break a little bit more. Um, one in the back, Joanne. Oh, it's full of them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, 
Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. So I think we're, so the question was, how long does it take to drain aquifers feeding things? Yeah. Um, well, some of these deep aquifers uh, have very, very slow movement toward them. So there's very, very old water in some of them. What I'm imagining is important for this surface water connection are much shallower things, okay? So I'm thinking of these as, as aquifers that are actively recharging under the current climate. So you'll notice that the precipitation in my model never interacts with the groundwater, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a tricky, it's a tricksy thing that we're doing right now because we really just want to highlight um, how does the morphology change if we change the rules about how we rub the water. Uh, so uh, it's not really realistic enough to deal with that question. Yeah. Yeah. Can we one more, Brad? Mm hmm The, in, that's the one in Florida, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, what's the difference? Um, yeah, so we're not thinking about special processes at the channel head um, that contribute to erosion at all. We're saying we assume all this erosion is essentially stream power fluvial erosion. So the only thing the groundwater is doing is contributing to energy for erosion, right? Uh, as to what the groundwater um, paths are, uh, so it's very dictated by the conditions of our of our model, okay? Which is essentially, if we're if we're trying to have these big fluxes of groundwater to be on the order of precipitation, we got to push it through pretty hard, and when we keep the snow flow on the sides it becomes very strongly wanting to just be, it just flows, you know, straight toward the edge, okay? When the channel heads grow, uh, they, they put another, they kind of pinch it down to this zero head a little bit, but it just turns out for the conditions that we've looked at so far, it doesn't do all that much to bend the kind of contours the, of the head surface very much, okay? So the head surface stays really flat, and so we're ending up with a relatively uniform feed of the groundwater out to these tributaries. Um, so, right, <laughs> caveat being these are the first 10 models we've run. Okay, so I think that if we were to, if we, when we get to the point of being able to increase the resolution of the model or increase the size of the domain, or perhaps allow for uh, boundary conditions on the side that pass water between them, um, I think it's possible that that, uh, that surface may become more sort of fluted, okay? Um, that's what we were expecting to see, essentially, that if a, if a stream could get in front of the others and kind of start warping the head surface toward itself, that it would really win um, from doing that. And we're, we're not seeing that as a huge result right now. We're seeing something like groundwater appears to favor kind of a more uniform distribution of the water and so a more, yeah, not, not channelizing so much. Um, so how to reconcile it? Yeah, it's a great, it's, it's a great question. We, we need to figure out how to do that. Thank you, Edison. Thanks.